attack I remember particularly is the one that struck formidable. Um, I was not flying that day and uh, the uh, strikes had flown off or at any rate the fighters had flown off possibly they'd flown off because the um, there was a warning that Japanese aircraft were in the area but uh, on that occasion I was acting as assistant uh, to the commander ops Walter Elliott uh, who spent most of his time in the plot which was a different room and which was separate but uh, at any rate uh, on this occasion my pilot Don Jupp was engaged in um, moving the deck park uh, which consisted of Avengers and some Corsairs forward of the barriers because once the fighters some fighters had flown off the stern of the carrier had to be clear in case they had suffered an engine problem and wanted to land on again. Yes, on the first uh, uh, attack on May the 4th, uh, which came really completely without warning, uh, and as I said, the deck park was being uh, uh, brought forward, so all the aircraft handlers were on deck. Um, I think there were about 11 killed, and something like almost 50 men wounded. One or two of the pilots taxiing forward were also, were also killed or very badly wounded. Being in an aircraft is a very, very uh, frightening business if there's an air raid coming in because I'd seen the formidable hit. Um, I'd been flying that day and we came down and we'd had some food and we were on the quarter deck and looking, just watching and there was an air raid warning and, and Teddy Hamill and Davis and I were standing together and we saw this airplane. I said, silly bugger, he's going to get shot at if he's not careful. I thought it was one of ours. And then I saw this puffs of smoke coming from his wings, and I said, that silly sod's firing. And he was firing at, at Formidable. And then he swooped over the deck, along the deck, and up, and as he went started up, our ship started to fire at him. And he went up in an arc and at the top of the arc he just pulled the stick back and he went straight down into the middle of the deck and we watched it I, I bet our mouths were both open and never seen anything so horrifying or quite splendid too in a way first of all they strafed the, the deck and it was very unfortunate because uh, I was flying at the time and I was about to be recalled to land on when this happened and so they were clearing the aft end of the deck of the deck park which uh, they had one course there and I think about uh, ten Avengers and they were taxiing them forward forward of the barrier so that we could land on uh, when this uh, kamikaze came down Zeke naval and navy fighter plane and it strafed the deck first of all and the aircraft taxiing forward and then it uh, it, it uh, pulled up and came straight down on the uh, opposite the island what had happened uh, I didn't know, I know in retrospect uh, and that was this uh, someone was observing and he said he saw this aircraft banking around and he thought what mad fool's that he said and then he, he said it had banked and then he saw that it had the uh, the round rings on it 
And this um, suicide, kamikaze, had gone back up into the sun because he was going to miss, he felt. And now he's making sure of it. And he came out of the sun uh, and straight down, you know. And he did. Yeah, it, um, uh, it killed quite a few. Uh, about 50-odd were injured, uh, burns and whatnot. It wasn't all that many killed. Um, but as I say, the, the, there was a lot of uh, burns and wounded and, and all sorts of things. There was a hole about two foot square in the, in the deck and some of the armoured deck had, had uh, uh, by the force of the explosion gone right down and uh, ended up in the in, in the double bottom somewhere and hit some pipes from the engine room which made an enormous amount of black smoke so it looked much worse than it actually was um, and they, there was an indentation about sort of ten foot square, I suppose, and two foot deep. So there was a slight bump, uh, hollow in the deck, and the actual hole they filled up with uh, quick um, um, drying cement. And uh, I landed on the, the indomitable and. and uh, somebody uh, Y2 I scored and landed on the Victorious and in about three hours time they had the deck ready for us to come back all except those from the Victorious who stayed on board the night and the following day they were sh they were uh, took off to, to come back to us and there was a uh, enemy attacks uh, scare when they took off and they were vectored out and they shot down at, uh, one of the chaps coming in so it was rather rather fortunate I remember the guns of all the fleet opening up uh, and there was uh, clearly an attack in progress and then quite suddenly there was a most enormous explosion uh, I went into the operational cabin which was closer to the flight deck because I thought that I could uh, look out of the scuttle there to see what had happened but when I got there the assistant, the first assistant to the commander ops, Lieutenant Berger, uh, had been in there and most unfortunately had been looking out of the scuttle at the time the kamikaze struck the formidable and he uh, uh, was unfortunately killed because the explosion blasted the glass from the scuttle into his face And one of my pilots, sort of duty, the duty pilot, uh, was in the air operations room, which was on the level of the deck underneath the bridge. And um, he got some shrapnel on his legs. A chap in front of him was killed outright, and he luckily uh, was uh, any wounded. He didn't fly again, of course, after that. But uh, unfortunately, the kamikaze uh, with a 500 pound bomb had landed just in front of the, our aircraft, which Don was taxiing forward, uh, when he hit the uh, formidable. And the flash burns that John suffered were terrible. He, uh, he managed to get out of the plane and went down, managed to walk down to the sick bay. The, um, the damage control 
on uh, in Formidable was incredibly good. The kamikaze had had great success against American carriers because they had wooden flight decks and they were often crippled by Japanese kamikazes. However, the formidable class, illustrious class, had armoured flight decks. I'm not clear exactly how thick the armour plate was, but for the fact that the bomb with the kamikaze had struck at a point where four uh, plates met, I think it probably wouldn't have done very much damage to the ship. Went through the f uh, the flight the uh, hangar deck down into the boiler room and severed a, a, a steam pipe, but apparently the uh, uh, engineer uh, uh, on duty down there was very smart and was able to cut off the steam, and uh, within two hours, formidable was back in action again. They'd. Uh, produce cement and uh, sand and cement from somewhere in the bowels of the ship, mixed up uh, uh, con concrete and filled the hole in. It exploded, it had a 500 pound bomb with it as well, which exploded on impact besides uh, all the fuel and everything on the aircraft. Uh, and this penetrated our armour plated deck. Uh, to the extent it went through to the hangar deck and cutting loose the, uh, uh, the fire curtain it was across, right across. The hangar, a big long hangar, was divided in three parts uh, by two fire curtains, so it was three hangars. Uh, but this one had come down, you know, that knocked that down. Uh, a part of the uh, piece of wherever it was carried on through the hangar deck, down through the main deck, and into the boiler room, uh, the centre boiler room, cutting a steam pipe as it went. And scene two, as somewhere near I was, uh, uh, here comes the, the two stokers, Chief and uh, uh, Tiddly Ball, rushing out of the boiler room. But in next to no time, uh, I think his name was Bevan, warrant officer. Uh, he was the brave man. Uh, I think got mentioned in dispatches. I don't, can't remember whether he had an asbestos suit or not, but he went down. I don't think anyone went with him, but he cross-connected all the pipes and things and got it going, and he came out and he said, um, OK, uh, lads, you can go back down below now, you know. So little tiddly ball says, come on, lads, you know. And one of them said uh, a bad word. No, he said, I'm not going down. You, you know, I'm not going. Come on, lad, it's all clear down there now. No, he said, I'm not going, you know. And he, uh, he refused to go below. And the officer said, well, I can shoot him, you know, all this sort of thing. He got three, three months in prison, you know, because of whatever. Um, I never knew his name, maybe as well, I don't know, you know. When I came back and this was still, it just happened, the ship's carpenters and shipwrights were already cementing over a hole in the middle of the flight deck which had been pushed down about 10 foot diameter through the armour plate. It had dented it like a saucer and a small piece of the armour plate exactly in the middle of the saucer had been blown out by the explosion and had gone down through the, the hangar deck, through the next decks below, eventually into the engine room through a high pressure steam pipe which of course let out stalled, scalding steam, steam throughout the engine room and had finished up in one of the fuel tanks in the double bottom of the ship. But I was able to land back aboard within two hours having temporarily landed for refueling in, in Implacable and I came back within two hours when I was told the flight deck was ready again to receive aircraft. This was a wonderful demonstration of how correct our policy had been in armour plating our carrier's flight decks. The Americans had never done that because they said this increased the height of the centre of gravity of the ship, having all this weight on top sides, would make them very unstable for operating. Uh, but we were certain the policy was right and we found our ships immensely stable and what was rather gratifying was that the American liaison officer from uh, Admiral Halsey who was in our ship 
a lieutenant commander, was the first to step forward and say, if this had been an American carrier, we would have been down to the bottom of the ocean. It would have gone straight through into the hangar deck and we'd have lost the ship. As it was, we were operating aircraft within a dog watch of the thing being aboard. Suddenly there's more shouts from up the other end there, fire in the torpedo shop. Uh, that was frightening. So us lot had a run round there. Uh, it wasn't all that bad. How it had happened, the torpedo shop uh, needed its own lift to get torpedoes there, and there's the long, thin torpedo lift, and obviously the blaster got through there somehow and caught fire in there. That was soon put up, but it's pandemonium, really, uh, uh, unreeling the hoses and everything there. Um, uh, the part there, there's uh, two um, two um, doors either side, and they both lead to the same place. And one of the petty officers had got one of the hoses, put it out, and through the other door, and somehow someone had done it and connected it up. So we had a circle of one hose going around nowhere. He never lived it down. He really did. So but anyway, that was got out. And now the next thing then, uh, you lot one. So we were then sent up on the flight deck. It was that my only time really I saw uh, the carnage and the whatever. As I arrived up there, they had one of the burning aircraft uh, on, um, on the crane. They got the crane, then they were lifting up the debris, just dropping overside. Other people were pushing planes over the side and get there. Um, uh, we were uh, sent up then on uh, foam generators, and it looked like it was all snowing up there, foam everywhere. Commander Fuller was running about and he's rolled up sleeves. He, wasn't, he didn't have all his gear on, flash gear or anything like that, you know. So, um, yeah, in short, it got under control. There, there was billowing black smoke coming out the funnel. I can remember that. But that was because of the boiler down below. Um, when that happened, there was just crude oil going in there, you know, and just black smoke coming out. And, of course, uh, as well, uh, the boiler, uh, there was a great shoot of steam because the relief valve had lift. So between it all up there, that looked uh, horrifying. Uh, the whole of the island was all um, badly burnt, you know. Uh, and we were carrying with us long-distance uh, petrol uh, tanks. Uh, our aircraft, to get extra distance, had these, like, um, fat little torpedoes slung underneath the aircraft, and these were hard to store. You couldn't fold them up, sort of thing, you know? So they were hanging ever, and they had them even hanging around by the funnel and the side, and they were blown everywhere, you know? And there was one, and there's a picture of it, one of the, um, I don't know, where the chief or something, climbed up the one of the WT masts, and they reckon there was a bit of the pilot, uh, you know, jammed up in the in the thing there, which he hooked out. And so it was quite pandemonium up there. It was, you know, um, and then the, the the rattle went, the rattle went. Uh, another one was coming. So we all had to clatter down. I can remember the noise of us running down the with the the handrails you can call it, with chains, and they were clanging and going and <laughs> running around like that. So uh, that was my experience of that of that one there, you know. Most of the carriers were hit by kamikazes, and uh, they, they uh, to one degree or another, uh, they were badly, either badly or not so badly knocked about, but they were all operating again within a very short space of time, and, and um, formidable, as I say, an hour and a half. And we, although we took on board her air crew that were flying, um, and uh, they landed on us and uh, probably other carriers. Um, they were soon back in the air and back on their own carrier. But we cleared lower deck after our first kamikaze, and the, the captain, uh, Philip Ruckkeen, gave a very sturdy warmer of the blood to all his anti-aircraft gun crews who were assembled on the flight deck about what he would do to the next gun's crew who deserted his gun because a kamikaze was about to engulf it. Uh, I think he would, wouldn't have carried out any of his threats, but shall we say it stiffened the resolve of a lot of the, uh, the gun's crews. But he did make it quite clear to them what their ultimate escape route was, and that was to get tucked in under the flight deck, which they could fairly readily do from their gun positions. But on the other hand, 
uh, they were very gallant men who did literally go on firing till they could see the whites of the pilot's eyes. There were some humorous stories told afterwards, as was typical in the Navy of my day. First, there was a story of a, one of the uh, uh, seamen on deck had been clearing up the rubble when he came across a Japanese coin and picking it up he said to the chap next to him what's he think he's going to do with this then? Spend it in our canteen? <laughs> Which was fairly typical of the approach of uh, the uh, people who were serving at that time. So there was no doubt we were very proud of our armor-plated flight deck and in later months many Americans came aboard our carriers to inspect these decks and find out how we had designed the ship to carry these decks and they of course justified themselves entirely in that one episode as far as the American Navy was concerned. And I saw the formidable some four well, six years later, when she was laid up in Rossar's dockyard, uh, ready for the scrappy, and it, uh, it was open to visitors. So I went down from uh, Edinburgh to have a look at the old girl, and that cement was still there. <laughs>